We've got Dirk Verburen from Megadeth on the podcast this week. I'm Todd Neef, and I have some conversations with interesting people and try to unpack their mental models and really learn out loud with the hopes that someone else listening to these conversations also enjoys it. So Dirk is a longtime freak drummer, one of the uh, one of the guys who's on dozens and dozens of different death metal, black metal, et cetera, records. You know, there's kind of a uh, a cabal of shadowy drummers who get the get the phone calls late at night when drummers drop out or or can't seem to play to a click and just come in and and just wreck shop in the studio. So I first encountered Dirk's work back in the the early 2000s and you know just saw him popping up over and over on on different extreme metal releases and he became the drummer for Megadeth a few years ago and that you know significantly raised his profile which is awesome and Dirk and I actually connected because he has a radio show and he played like rats on it a few months ago so we uh you know I reached out to him based upon that and figured we'd have a conversation for you guys and Dirk um Super interesting guy, super, super insightful, analytical. And I wanted to talk to him just about the the way that he thinks about balancing creativity uh, as well as the the you know freakish ability to mimic stuff that's necessary of session drummers. So that was sort of what I wanted to talk about in this conversation took some unexpected turns into the value of science, the danger of conspiracy theory, the ability to stay present. So really insightful stuff from Dirk on this. Um, Dirk has a ton of different projects going on. He he teaches drum lessons. He has a recording studio that he's um, in the process of of building out in L.A. Um, the the most recent Cadaver recordings actually feature Dirk, which I didn't realize until I was looking at his Metallum page, uh, researching this conversation. So those are great. He has a, a, a solo project, well not a solo project, a side project that's sort of like his main creative output called Bent C, which is kind of grind core-ish stuff with um, Shane from Napalm Death, and that stuff is really, really good as well, and his radio show. So check all that stuff out. We'll include links to all those things in the show notes. If you want to hear more from me, subscribe to my newsletter. You can click through in the show notes, toddneef.com, and input your email there. I send it out every Friday. It has some stuff that I've enjoyed over the week, and people seem to like it, so maybe you will too. And go ahead, enjoy this conversation with Dirk Verburen from Megadeth. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's funny because um, I think I first became aware of you from that aborted record that you recorded. Oh, oh really? The Gormagan? Yeah, because mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I picked up that CD. And it's actually funny. I went and flipped through it before doing this interview, right? Because I remember buying that for some reason. You know, I mean, I, I certainly was aware of the band and was like somewhat of a fan of that kind of technical death metal. And I just remember in that first track, um, there's, you know, the, the, the big mama riff with like the squeals and everything. And you're playing something just nuts on that. Like, I remember just listening to that and being like, what the hell is this guy even playing? And, you know, I still kind of don't really know. And then, you know, you look up, you look in the liner notes and you're like, who actually played drums on this? Oh, it's one of those session guys. Like, okay, cool. And I just kind of became aware of your name and then, you know, saw you pop up in soil work and like a bunch of other stuff over the years. So, I mean, I guess, you know, you wanted to start with Megadeth, but what the hell were you playing in that aborted part? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was a very organic process, the recording of Gormageddon. It happened kind of in a funny way where Sven, you know, reached out to me and said, hey, are you free to, to do this recording with us? And I practiced a little bit, but, you know, they didn't have a lot of the stuff was very open when they sent it to me. They just sent me like a few songs had like I think actually the first song had demo drums on it or, you know, like some rough recording. But a lot of the songs were just guitar riffs. So and I didn't have a lot of time. It was a couple of weeks, I think, to kind of where I had time here and there to listen to it and try a few things on drums. And, and Sven said, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. So we go to the studio, we get there, the studio was being finished, it was being remodeled, so we actually had to wait a few days, and we had really energy was growing, you know, we were just hanging out, basically waiting to be able to start. So when we were finally good to go, I just had this, like, I don't know where it came from, but I had this torrent of inspiration that just happened, and I actually, which is the only time this ever happened, I recorded, like, almost the entire album in one day, like, eight songs. And it's, it's I don't know, I don't even know, like you know, how that came to be, but it was just very organic. The guys were super excited about my ideas and we were just running through the tracks and they're like, you know, every now and then someone would say, Hey, can you try this here? Or how about this? You know, we, we heard more of that kind of beat, but, but in general, they really let me just express what came out of me at the moment. And, and that actually later on, you know, at that time I didn't really realize that, but later on that became a bit of a, um, 
a way of working for me. So we can talk about that, you know, later in the podcast. Yeah, totally. So, so for you then with, 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 I guess like that session work, is that kind of like a combination of improvisation and sort of like prepping what you want to do? Or are you just like hitting record and playing a few takes and seeing what happens? What, what actually occurs there? Um, it really depends on the project. So if it's, you know, every now and then I get, I, I work with people that have a very specific vision about what they want. And, and, and so then it takes often more preparing. And, you know, in certain cases, I have to sit and write down the parts, chart out the songs and the specific drums, if I know that that's what they're looking for. In other cases, people just send me like, hey, here's a bunch of guitars, just play whatever. Usually I ask people to kind of map out like, hey, what do you hear? You know, is this the verse? Is this the chorus? I mean, it's not always super evident to figure that stuff out, even though I, I've developed a good sense of that, I think. But it's really, it, it's all across the map. It's anywhere from play exactly this to be you, do whatever you want and everything in between. And uh, so so over the years, that's definitely um, inspired me to dig into what comes out when I just sit down and start recording, which is something that I talk a lot to my drum students about this, you know, it's something that in the beginning for a lot of people it's stressful because, you know, the red light panic or whatever, or whatever people call it. Um, as soon as you're recording, all of a sudden you freeze up and you're like, ah. And so I've learned to manage that kind of tension in a positive way where instead of letting that bog me down, I use that energy to just play and see what happens and not be afraid if I do a take and I'm like, yeah, that was utter crap. I'm going to start again because that's the beauty of recording. You can always start again. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Well, yeah. So, I mean, um, we, we can dig into some of the studio stuff, uh, uh, later on, but, I, but let, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, about Megadeth. Cause I mean, you know, like you mentioned, a lot of people know you from, from becoming involved in, in Megadeth a few years back. And that's an interesting situation for anyone coming into it because you're being at some level hired to, to recreate something, right? It's like, okay, like people know what the drum parts are on rust and peace and they they want the exact fill. And if it's not the same fill, it's like, dude, I'm in the crowd and I know what Menza played there and you didn't play it and I'm pissed. So, you know, that, that, that's an interesting dynamic to come into. What, what was that like? Yeah. And that's, and that's actually, you're absolutely right. That's exactly the part where, you know, because this is also in a way session work, obviously I joined the band, but it started out as me, uh, you know, initially filling in for a tour and then that turned into a, a full, time job and yeah it's one of those places where you come in there's a huge legacy there's a musical history that's you know it's made history it, it means a lot to a lot of people and as a fan i understand that i mean i'm a fan of megadeth and a lot of other bands that i grew up with and i also wouldn't want some guy coming up there and playing like you know something that that i don't that's not there initially and that i don't expect so i mean sometimes people can can kind of twist and turn things in their own way and still make it cool. But in general, like if, if I'm going to see, you know, Slayer play, I want, I want the parts that Lombardo recorded, you know, or, or if it's a Bo Staff song, whatever, I don't want something completely different. So you go in there, you do the best you can. For me, it was a case of initially the band, you know, cause I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So the band were very cool with me doing what I was able to do in the short amount of time I had. And then I went more in depth, as time went on. So I went back um, after my initial, you know, run with them and stuff. I went back and studied the songs more in detail because I had a little more time. I actually got them to send me a lot of the just drum tracks. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah, which is super helpful, especially for the older stuff, the Gar stuff, which is some of the most intricate stuff and also some of the most poorly recorded stuff back then. Yeah. And so I discovered a lot of things that I had kind of heard but wasn't doing quite right in those, you know, in, in that time where I would sit down and really study it. So, because, you know, it's like you said, I mean, of course, there's a few things where I can put my stamp on it, even in Megadeth. It's not like completely 100% identical all the time, but but at the same time, you have to respect that those are the songs that people know. Those are the songs that became big. I want to I wanna do that just as, as much as, as I want to hear it being done well. Totally. Is there something that stands out that uh, that you picked out with with just the just the drum tracks from any of Gar's recordings? I mean, Gar was just he was a one of a kind drummer. I have to say, like in that era, I don't think there was anybody that played the kind of fills and the kind of grooves that he did in the way that he did. I mean, there was an obvious obvious inspiration from people like you know Carmine Apice and and Vinny even and and that whole generation of drummers that was definitely in there. But there was also a a different flair that was just all gars and so 
Like, for example, the field where he goes between, you know, Tukata, Kutaka, Tukata, Kutaka, where he goes between the crash symbol and kick and then two snare hits in between. Like, he uses that a lot, especially on Killing Is My Business, but also you, you can find it on some uh, P-Cell songs too. And and that's some, and he does it at speeds where you're just like, <laughs> it took me some practicing to to kind of get comfortable with that. And, and then just, and he would do very unexpected things, you know, like fills in places where you don't expect there to be a fill. And, and somehow it works and it flows really beautifully. So so there was a lot of, a lot I picked up from Gar that that now is like, you know, I'm trying to make it part of my own vocabulary now because it's just exciting. It's just cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that that's a really, you know, for, for those who aren't aware of the, I guess, the history of of Megadeth, um, Gar Samuelson, the drummer, and then Chris Poland, the the guitarist, um, were sort of hired by Dave Mustaine. And they had been, you know, jazz fusion musicians um, playing together previously. So, you know, the 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 sort of like general whatever paradigm of Megadeth is this like ripping thrash metal band is true. But if you actually pay attention to a lot of the details, it's like, what the hell are these guys even playing? Absolutely. And and Dave says it beautifully. He says, I want every guy in my band to be a solo guy, not just the lead guitar player plays a solo. He's like, I want solo vocals, solo bass, solo drums, everything. And he, he tells me that too. And when we're working on new stuff, which we recently did, you know, he's like, I want solo drums. I want you to go nuts and, and do cool stuff, which is awesome because here's a, here's a guy that, you know, built this, this musical empire because he has a very strong vision and a very strong identity that he's, you know, intimately, you know, involved in at all times in his life. And yet, you know, he lets people that, from the outside like myself come in and and bring our own ideas to the table he's very open to that and he retains a lot of those ideas actually when it's a good idea and he feels it fits he keeps it and that's that's the beauty of megadeth and i think that's how it started and that's still how it is to to this day there might have been times maybe where it was a little bit different i'm not sure because obviously (laughs) i've only been in the band for a few years but it's it's I, i i have a lot of admiration for that ability to let other people's talent and other people you know, other people, he lets them shine, if you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. It's it's an ability to whatever, set a vision and then turn people's skills loose on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so in, in another uh, video, you, you mentioned that I think Wake Up Dead is your favorite Megadeth song to play, you know, just as a fan of the band. Um, I'm curious to know, is there any particular part, not just song, but, you know, I, I can sort of think through, okay, like, being a whatever 17 year old learning to play guitar, like by figuring out songs from Megadeth and Slayer, you know, you just imagine yourself like playing parts, not even songs. Is there anything that sticks out as like this part? This is the part that I want to play. It's, it's very simple, man. It's the opening, the first groove in the song. So wake up. That is the, the first uh, Megadeth song I ever heard. I bought peace cells on vinyl, not really knowing the band I'd heard of them, but I didn't know them. So I took it home, put it on. It, it hit me instantly. And that opening groove, which is actually a very intricate drum groove, there's a lot of ghost notes happening. There's some really cool accents that kind of evolve throughout the riff in different places. So for me, it's just gold, like from the get go, the fill, you know, the cool snare fill that kicks off the album. And then just that groove is just really gar shining. And so that just left a huge mark on me at the time. I was probably, you know, maybe 14 or 15 i don't know exactly how old i was when i bought it but something around there so it's like it just it just blew my mind and uh, another one i can mention too is in 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 the conjuring uh that ending you know the big riff in the end so that that riff the drums on there yeah it's just it's so like liberating to play that part it's just like yeah. you can just feel the power and the energy, and I just absolutely adore that. <laughs> yeah, that 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 part in the Conjuring is the one that you know stands out to me as like that would just be so fucking cool to play that. Ah, oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that I can actually say that, but yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. It just it just hits so hard, right? And, it, and it's such a great opportunity to just like okay, like let the riff play, and then just like just nail those hits, and yeah, yep. it's awesome. Exactly. Yeah, that's very exciting. So um, you guys toured with the Scorpions too, which is so cool as well. Um, yeah. Well, well, yeah. T- tell me about that because I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Scorpions fan and I think that, um, you know, the Scorpions are an interesting band in the States at least where I think a lot of people know the Scorpions just from like a few radio hits. And I think that um, they don't necessarily realize like the depth 
of the catalog of that band and like what they've done. Um, and I'm not sure what the, what the dynamic is in Europe actually with the Scorpions, but I think the appreciation there might be a little bit different. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, they also had big hits in, in Europe at, at, you know, probably a lot of those same songs, but I think they did have a little bit more of a, a, a following from the get go with the heavier stuff that they did in the, in the early days. So, um, this being said, I never went to a Scorpion show there and stuff, so I can't really speak for that. But when we were on tour with them, it was cool because, I mean, we got to play like, you know, just from my perspective, we got to play like uh, Madison Square Garden, the Forum in L.A. And those two things for me were absolutely incredible. You know, just like I can't believe I'm on this stage playing like I've seen huge bands here and and uh, it was really cool. I mean, the Scorpions have a very diverse set. You know, they play obviously a lot of their hits and then some of the heavier stuff as well. And we decided to just go full on heavy. So we, I don't think we even played like Atulamon, which is kind of a, a classic usually in the set. I don't think we even played that on most of the tour. It was just heavy from beginning to end. You know, that was kind of what Dave wanted to do. And I'm, of course, you know, the heavier, the better for me. So, <laughs> so I was all sure. in with that. But it was it was a really cool experience to be on 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 the road with a band of that magnitude. The guys were really cool. Mickey D was you know stellar. I watched yeah. most of his drum solos throughout the tour, and it was just every night just very inspiring. Yeah, my um, my parents recently listened to the the winds uh, the winds of change podcast. Right, I don't know. Have you listened to that at all? No. <laughs> What yeah, it's, it, I haven't listened to it yet, but it, apparently someone did a podcast series on the rumor that um, the CIA sort of like wrote that song as <laughs> like, uh, um, you know, they, they gave it to Klaus as like, hey, here's this song, you know, we're going to release this and it'll like take down communism or whatever. Um, and it's, <laughs> okay. uh, it's, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, it's an interesting story. And, um, you know, my, I, I don't, I, I don't think there's any truth to that rumor, but I guess the podcast kind of like digs into a lot of different aspects of the climate at the time and some aspects, of, uh, aspects of the scorpions. And so my parents are now like huge scorpions fans. Um, and you know, they, yeah, they liked, they also liked the, uh, the movie about joy division. Oh, um, or about Ian Curtis, right? So, yes. yeah. So my parents now like Joy Division and the Scorpions, and those are like their two things that they're into, which is like pretty cool. I guess they, they might be becoming cooler than you, man. <laughs> Beware. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that that's already the case. I'm extremely uncool, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not hard, not hard to do. It's just not I have to say to I, I I can relate to 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 what you're telling me. My 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 parents were always extremely supportive of what I did. You know, I started off playing some really, you know, intense music and they always came to the shows, you know, bought the records, insisted to buy the records. They even helped us a lot with Scarf back in the day with our early recordings when we needed money to go to the studio and couldn't collect it all, like get it all together. So because we were, you know, essentially teenagers and and uh, and so they've always been, you know, and my dad would be like, oh, man, I like I really like that band Hypocrisy. You know, so one time we were on tour with with uh, Hypocrisy with Soil Work and I got Peter Tactor into like get me all i got nuclear blast to give me like the entire discography and peter to sign them all and i said yeah i'm i'm a huge fan too by the way but this is for my dad <laughs> so, so, yeah so then my parents came to see one of the shows they traveled to new york city to come see us play there with hypocrisy and i said here's the whole here's the whole discography for you so that was that's my dad you know listening to like obscure obscene i'm at home and stuff i'm like, that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah that's awesome was he into other like extreme metal like that or did you just, did he just latch on to hypocrisy no there's lots of it that he likes i mean it was he, they were always just super open to that. They never had an issue with that. I, I My dad was a pharmaceutical researcher. And when I was a kid, he would travel, you know, when I lived in, in France at the time, he would travel to the States every year to go do like uh, meetings and congresses and stuff. And, uh, and, and, um, and I would always, you know, at a certain age, I started giving him lists of like CDs to bring back to me because, you know, I couldn't find everything in France. And he'd bring me back like, you know, Cannibal Corpse, like, with those covers, you know, like NWA, like no problem. And I was like, you know, 15, 16. And they were never like, son, why are you listening to this madness? You know, no, they were like, here, this is what you like. Go ahead, man. Have fun. And, and so in turn, I'm like, you know, the cleanest guy. <laughs> never done drugs <laughs> in my life. Never smoked. <laughs> stopped drinking a long time ago. Like never, you know, I'm just a super peaceful person. And so it goes to show that, you know, when 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 your parents put trust in you, it can go a long way. Yeah, my 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 parents confiscated a Red Hot Chili Peppers CD from me when I was in probably like 
fourth or fifth grade. <laughs> Ouch. I, I, I guess they, it was uh, it was one hot minute, and I guess they went through and listened to it. And there's one song with uh, with several f words, and it you know that that CD was gone. That didn't that didn't happen. Yeah, I got to tell you that when I was listening to like NWA and stuff, if I you know, doing homework and my mom came in the room, I would usually turn it down because I was like, okay, I don't need my mom to hear some of these things they're saying. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I learned after the Red Hot Chili Peppers CD was confiscated, and I know my parents occasionally listen to this, so sorry that you know I did this, but uh, I bought I, I did buy a bunch of like rap CDs, so I had like. Buster Rhymes, Wu Tang Clan, etc. Um, and I had like some shoebox or something, and I just hid those in there. I kept them away from the rest of my other CDs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. But it's all entertainment uh, in the too end, important. You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. And 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 that's the thing. I think, you know, it's it's in the end, like, yes, a lot of these a lot of this music talks about crazy stuff and doesn't always say it in the most poetic way, but at the same time, it's, it's for me, like I find it, I do the same, you know, with a lot of my lyrics, I put some of my stuff in there that I'm really pissed off about or frustrated or just stuff I want to say that I don't have any other way to say. And it, it's, it, it's liberating. It's like, it kind of cleanses it out of your system in a way you put it down in a song. And that doesn't mean I go around like doing those things or, or advocating for violence or whatever. It's just like, I mean, we all have, you know, we're, we're, we're animals, right? So we all have a, a sense of aggression in us, like different levels for different people, obviously in different situations. But I think ignoring that or pretending it's not there is way worse than just finding an outlet for it. Yeah, I think that that's real. That um, you know, the 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 ability to differentiate between okay, I'm doing something that's whatever a creative project or you know attempting to express something versus these are my actual beliefs are you know those are obviously different things. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's sometimes um, a fine line to walk, but you know, it's, it's it's something you learn over the years, I guess, as you as you mature. <laughs> totally. So so you mentioned your dad was involved in pharmaceutical research, and I was listening to some other interviews with you where you talked about um, just like an interest in science growing up, etc. And I actually think that that's super interesting for for people who have like the a combination of you know creativity and interest in art and music, etc., as well as like I guess a more analytical, um, tendency. What, what was, what was your background with that? I mean, you, you, I think you were interested in potentially pursuing science if, if, if you didn't become a musician, is that true? Yeah, I, I didn't really know, you know, like many young people, I guess what I wanted to do after high school. And, and so, and the science classes were the ones that I was the most passionate about. If there was any passion, I don't know if there was actually any passion, but that was stuff that I could actually see myself in and be like, you know, studying things like volcanoes and, and chemistry and things like that were, I had some interest. So, and, and my dad doing that and, and obviously that being around in my life, even though he didn't talk that much about his job and stuff, but you know, science was, was there from the beginning for me. And, and, uh, as well, as well as music, by the way, because my parents always, both of them listened to music, both of them played instruments just for fun, not professionally, but so both of those things were always around for me. And, and, and when I finished high school, um, the decision to go with music was, was again, very much just a feeling, you know, and since they were okay with it, I was like, well, I'll just give it a shot and see what happens. At that point, I'd been playing drums for some years. I I'd played a bunch of other instruments before that. And I think they were like, okay, maybe he's, you know, they, they told me often, like, it seems that you know what you're doing when you're sitting down. I mean, I played drums in their house for <laughs> three years. So, so they, they're like, you seem to be knowing what you're doing behind the kit. So, so give it a shot, work hard and you know, here I am. But but I think um, I think when it comes to science, it's, it's an interesting time where especially in it seems in the US, you know, so many people seem to not believe in science, which is completely something I just from my point of view, it's it's very difficult to imagine because science is not something that pretends to be anything else than reality. You know, it's 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 a very simple concept of th th theories about things and then fact checking them with what we know, what we've learned over the course of history and then if it adds up, it can be confirmed as truth. And if it doesn't add up, then it remains some form of theory. And, and it seems to me that anything outside of that is is what we should be a little bit more critical about and not science, you know. So so for that to be discredited as much as is happening today is, is a bit of a scary thing. Um, and something that, you know, for me, like I said, it's very hard to grasp how uh, people, you know, I mean, one plus one equals two, man. It's 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 very simple, you know. And and every every more complicated form of science that's being confirmed is the same. And I don't pretend to understand all of it, so I get that people could say, oh, well, 
just because this guy says that. But that's the thing. It's actually had this conversation. Sorry to talk a lot about this, but I actually had this conversation with my wife. Um, it's great. Thanks. <laughs> a couple of days ago where, where she said, you know, your point of view is interesting because so I grew up with my dad being a pharmaceutical researcher, going to all these meetings where this is something maybe a lot of people don't know because their dad is not a researcher. What happens is the scientific community is a worldwide thing with a lot of people that work for a lot of different enterprises, companies, universities, you name it, you know, professors, teachers, researchers, all kinds of people. And they all get together in different parts of the world to talk about what they're working on, you know, what they're trying to 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 develop or research they've done. And so there's a lot of debating happening between a lot of, you know, between thousands and thousands of very smart, very educated people. And so with this whole thing of discrediting science, when 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 certain people see all this as some kind of consp- worldwide conspiracy that's happening, where like they're hiding the truth from us, they're just you know they're they're putting stuff in vaccines to control us and stuff. When you know a little bit how those things work, you realize that that's just a silly idea because you could never control like all these people. For, imagine like controlling all the like I'm just gonna throw that out there, all the Chinese scientists, you know, and all the Australian scientists and all the Indian scientists and and imagine like that's impossible like even if you tried even if you were some kind of you know uh, evil superhero or whatever and you tried to like have this worldwide conspiracy it would never work because because these countries don't even you know can't even work together on the simplest things so let alone like all these independent people it's just completely ludicrous to to think that anything like that would exist there's way too much checks and balances fortunately in the scientific world for for it to be pretty clear that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a conspiracy. (laughs) Yeah. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting layers to, you know, you're mentioning the, whatever, let's call it increased skepticism of a lot of scientific stuff. And maybe it's not even necessarily increased skepticism, but at least like more um, vocal skepticism or more prominent skepticism, where maybe plenty of people had these beliefs previously, but, you know, they didn't necessarily feel comfortable sharing them or didn't have an opportunity to share them. So it's, you know, it's tough to say like, okay, how much is this increasing and how much is it not? But, you know, just listening to you talk about that, something that I think is really um, interesting about, let's call it, uh, you know, conspiracy theory or misplaced skepticism is, you know, what, to someone involved in that community that you're talking about is seen as um, whatever valid disagreement, like, okay, maybe you have this theory about how this works. And, you know, maybe you understand that there's some perverse incentives for, you know, pharmaceutical companies to do certain types of things in order to, you know, make sure they get as much money as possible from the the drug patent that they have, that there's like a lot of like bad stuff happening. Of course. But that, you know, people who are immersed in that community understand the dynamics of it and know how to navigate it. And that, that you know, that they can have arguments with each other in good faith. But if you don't know that stuff and you see it, it looks like a bunch of people who like don't actually know what they're talking about are engaging in a bunch of like political wheeling and dealing and making a bunch of money. So it's easy to assume that the entire operation is based upon something faulty rather than it's like, actually, it's a complicated mess, just like everything. But, you know, the the stuff that they're saying isn't like some grand conspiracy. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Absolutely. You know, I think that's exactly how it is. And so I, I do, I can see that part where, you know, for people who are not so familiar with the way those things work, that point of view could develop itself, I guess. And that's why I think it's important for, for in my case, me to say like how I see it, because I don't just believe in science just because, you know, I mean, to me, it just makes makes logical sense. And I know from from through my dad and through a lot of his colleagues who I've got to know over the years, that is just not that simple. These are, again, these are highly educated people and they're sure some pharmaceutical company big shot, you know, he's going to think about business and money as well. He has to, or else you can't have a company. And, and, and like you said, twisted things can happen there sometimes, but in general, like you don't go into like my dad, like researching blood vessels so you can help people with some kind of evil plan in mind. You just don't, you know? And I think if, and I think a lot of people, if, if evil plans show up, they'll be like, I'm out. Like, this is not what I'm doing this for. I don't want to hurt people. I want to help people. That's the thing about scientific you know, research and especially about everything relating to medical research is that these people want to help people. And I think they do, you know, I think a lot of the things out there 
do help people and 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 do make people better and help them beat diseases and stuff including this you know hopefully this pandemic there will be some solutions coming up so that's that's what those people are striving for not to like somehow you know subdue the human race and be the <laughs> whatever almighty ruler of the earth you know <laughs> Yeah, totally. Well, and, and and on that note too, right? I mean, the people who are actually working on these problems, you know, they're engaged in figuring out the balance between complicated trade-offs, right? And and yeah. I think that something that's that's really dangerous and challenging about the current information environment is that a lot of people assume that everyone else is always acting in bad faith. That that there's an assumption like you don't actually think that you have this covert agenda that you're trying to push forward, right? Whether it's a conspiracy, like you don't actually think this, you're just trying to, you know, control everyone with vaccines, or you don't actually think this, you're just trying to get your political party elected. You don't actually think this, you're just trying to, you know, get power for whatever. And, you know, I mean, honestly, it makes sense that humans have some sort of like wiring to be on the lookout for that stuff because people do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, if you are someone who's, uh, you know, like an actual scientist trying to figure out the truth. It's like, yeah, you have these competing incentives. Like, you know, we talked about some of the the negative regulations surrounding pharmaceutical companies. You know, within academia, there's a lot of perverse stuff happening related to, you know, how different projects get funded. And, you know, maybe you have to like do some weird stuff to get on a tenure track. Like all this stuff is real. You know, people Mm -hmm. will block peer reviewed research because it challenges their paradigm or it's like not from their friend. Like that shit happens. But, you know, the, the assumption that it's all bad faith and it's all like political maneuvering, you know, is really just toxic to um, whatever actually figuring out the truth. Like you mentioned, like at some level, there is a one plus one equals two. And despite all that, we can still figure it out. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I think John Stewart said it best recently. You know, he said it's a very black and white society and you got to real and nuance is getting lost. It's all it's it's either either all or nothing. And on both sides, a little bit of that, you know, and I think I think science is all about nuance. Science is all about grays and about trying to figure out how things work exactly by exploring all the different possibilities. You know, like a good example is people researching uh, the cosmos, you know, and the galaxy and the universe and, and trying to understand how all that works. And they explore some of the most insane theories because truthfully, we don't know much about it at all yet. And so we have to explore those ideas in order to see, like, could that remote possibility be true? Okay, maybe, but it's highly unlikely. Okay. And then, you know, that's just how it works. So I, I think that, you know, in the end, it's it's the it's it's the problem with capitalism. I mean, no system is going to be perfect. And Capitalism isn't perfect either. It's, it's. I guess you can say in general for a lot of people, it's a good, you know, system. But the downfall of it is that, well, it's money is the almighty God for everything. And that perverts a lot of things that initially start out as a good thing and then um, turn turn away from that because of the value of money and, and because some people don't have scruples and some people don't have mor- morals and and that messes it up. But you're never going to find... I believe, you know, the way the world is now, you're never going to find a perfect system. You just have to make do with the least worst, right? Just kind of like how people talk about politics a lot is not about great politicians. It's about vote for the one that's the least shitty. But I guess that's a very negative view. And and I don't really necessarily feel that. I do think, I do believe that there are a lot of good people out there that want good for people and that want good for humanity because I see it around me. I see a lot of good people around me and I see a lot of good people across the globe. It's actually one of the greatest things about touring. When I started touring and especially, oh, sure. you know, coming from Europe, coming to the US, going to, you know, Japan, Australia, different cultures, I was actually a little bit shocked to see how a lot of the things that even in in Europe we would see in the media were overblown and exaggerated, you know, and kind of stereotyped versus how it really is. And I really kind of embraced the world at that point, you know, because when you see that the people you actually meet are actually the same than you, even in Japan or, you know, places where it's like a very different culture and a very different way of living and of dealing with things, you realize that, okay, you know, sure, there's always going to be pockets of bad people and bad people doing bad things and stuff. But in general, most people just want to live a good life, be kind to each other, you know, be happy, you know, and, and, that's the truth. I see that every time. And, and we all see that when we tour, we go and play anywhere and there's a, a venue packed with 
a bunch of people that are just there to have a good time listening to music. They're not there to like harm anyone or for some crazy agenda. And that speaks volumes to me. Yeah, totally. I think that, um, a really interesting dynamic with, I mean, touring is sort of weird cause it, you know, it's this, um, I don't know, you're almost in like a bubble of like, okay, I'm going to this place and yeah, I'm in this totally different city, but I'm also just like, I'm at the venue and then I sound check and then maybe there's like a Starbucks nearby, which is basically the same everywhere. And then I'm back in the venue. Yeah. So it's like kind of a weird experience. Cause even though you're exposed to a lot of culture, it's in like, uh, like I said, it's kind of like a bubble, but to your point, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, you see a lot of stuff that's really interesting. That's, you know, you're surprised at how much things are the same everywhere, but then there's like little things that are way more different than you would expect. Do you, do you have any examples of things that, that caught you by surprise by either how this, how much the same or how different they are? Yeah. I mean, to me, Japan always stands out. You know, I remember very well the first time I went there with soil work back in 2004 was my second tour with them. And, and that was just a culture shock. Um, everything about it, you know, the way the shows were set up, the, the the perfection with which local crews worked on everything. It was it was the story, which I'm sure people have told where a guy comes in and takes pictures of your kit. And the next day for the second show, you show up and your kit set up like to the, you know, to the quarter inch, like exactly the same. And that's just, you know, and then the way they just treat you, you know, come as a Westerner coming to Japan, they have all these kind of I wouldn't say rituals, but they have these things they do, like they'll bring you gifts, they'll take you places, you know, it's like, and to them, it's like an honor code almost, like they have to do this. It's so ingrained in their society to to treat the people that come in from abroad a certain way and, and really show them like, this is what Japan is, this is what we're all about, this is how we do things, this is on us, like we'll take you there. It's beautiful, you know, it's, it's a very different dynamic than anything you see anywhere else in the world, at least where I've been. And so that really stood out. You know, I've, I fell in love with Japan right away. And I actually was able to, a couple of years ago, to take my wife there when we had some shows with Megadeth and stay a few extra days and check it out. And she fell in love with it too. It's it's an absolutely, and, and we didn't see much of Japan at all. I've, like you said, I've mostly seen like Tokyo and a few cities and haven't really been able to explore the countryside. But but um, but yeah, man, it's, it's, it's one of the beautiful things about touring is just learning how much, you know, even throughout those differences, we're all still just people trying to make the best of our lives very simply. Yeah, totally. Totally. So I want to jump back into some stuff about, you know, playing drums, recording, studio time, et cetera. So, you know, like we started to touch on before, you have a lot of experience, both as kind of like a hired gun session musician. Um, in some cases, like, hey, there's nothing here. Like, go ahead and just play whatever you want. Other cases, like, you need to do this exact thing. Um, and in other cases, it's like, hey, you know, you, you know, this is your band and it's sort of like your creative expression, um, you know, as, as a player or whatever. So I guess something that I'm curious about is given all those different dynamics that you're in and especially seeing just the way some musicians, you know, exist on the internet, et cetera, there seems to be sort of a class of musicians who are incredible mimics. You know, you see them all over YouTube, et cetera. And it's like, these people can play anything, mm -hmm. right. But they're not necessarily um, like terribly creative. Right. Um, but in some rare cases, there are people that like have the capacity to mimic uh, like excellently as well as be creative. Right. And, and you know, you're certainly in that latter category. Hey, and you, you teach a lot of students. So you may. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Um, <laughs> but you, you teach a lot of folks, too. So you may have some perspective on this. Do you think there's a trade off between this this ability to mimic and the ability to be creative? Or is it just rare to have the combination of the two? That's a very interesting question. Um, I have to think. I mean, for me, you know, I, it's hard to know about other people's experiences and how they get where they go. For me, music has always been something that from a youngest age, it just was in my heart. It spoke to me. It made me feel things. It made me excited. And to this day, I look for that excitement. Like it's evolved a little bit from like just hearing something on the radio as a kid where you're just like, oh my God, I don't know why, but I just love this and I want to hear it again and getting out a cassette, recording it and listening to it over and over. And then I started like making like mixes with like different bits and pieces of songs and spoken things from Beastie Boys or whatever and trying to make like funny stuff. That was like my first kind of creative endeavors as a probably nine year old or 10 year old, whatever, something like this? that. 
I don't know. I've actually, I, I need to ask my dad if those tapes are somewhere, but um, yeah, that'd be really funny. Here's my new release. <laughs> but, uh, but, but then, you know, now I, I get more of that when I'm creative myself. So, or sometimes you, 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 should, you, should, you should find those and be like, Dave, I have an idea for uh, the new, the new Megadeth. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I know I'd... you're really open to ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that'd be great to see his face, but, uh, but yeah, not, nowadays i find more of that stuff in 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 creativity and and it's still that same thrill you know so for me expressing myself behind my instrument it doesn't matter the format or or you know it doesn't matter if it's the thing where i have to do exactly what i'm asked or if it's a thing where i have complete freedom or if it's a thing where i'm just trying to come up with cool ideas and be creative i just when i get behind the drums and I can get into that mindset of like, wow, I get to play drums, which for me is still something that to this day, I'm like, I feel extremely fortunate. You know, I would have never thought as a younger person that I would ever be making a living doing music, let alone this kind of music. You know, I mean, if you listen to the stuff I put out, like myself, it's like, it's pretty, it's not for everyone, right? It's pretty like uh, intense stuff and pretty twisted stuff. So, so to be able to do that and spend, time doing that is, is to me it's it's a wonderful thing so so the the parameters it doesn't really matter if i if i say yes to a gig or i get asked to do something by a friend or whatever to help them out i, I give myself 100 percent, and that's something i've learned over the years to harness is like um doesn't matter you know what's happening right now in my life or what's going on or how i'm feeling like if i get on stage for example with megadeth i give 100 percent and some days 100% is 100%. Some days it's maybe 80, you know, because you're maybe some days you don't play as well as others. You're not feeling that great. You have a harder time getting into it. But I never walk off stage these days feeling like, oh, man, I, I could have done more. You know, I always try to give the most I can to to what I'm doing. So basically what I'm saying is, you know, some people might be good at one thing. Some people might be good at another. And, and that's all fine because I think there's room for all of those different things. I'm just very lucky that that I'm able to feel that passion and that I was also supported as much as I was by my parents to be able to get an education in music, to learn about all kinds of different music, to have amazing teachers that showed me, you know, things I had no idea about and then to kind of take all that and make it my own because a lot of that happens because you have time for it. And my parents really allowed me to have that time. You know, they helped me out a lot in my early 20s and stuff so that I wouldn't have to go get some job at a restaurant or whatever in order to pay for my music school and then not really have time to do the work. They said like, look, my dad said to me, like, if you had gone to university and studied science, I would have had to help you too, because you would have really intense, you know, uh, classes and all that stuff. I know here in the States, it's more common for people to like have a job and then go to school and people manage that. In Europe, it's a bit less common, or at least it was when, you know, 20 years ago and I was growing up there 25 years ago. But, but, uh, so they really supported me and allowed me some years to really just focus on drums, focus on the bands I was doing, play with a bunch of people and learn. And all that comes out now. So, you know, maybe not everybody has that opportunity to, to do all those things and, Maybe some people just sit at YouTube and, and, you know, nowadays and learn stuff from other people that they watch and then just kind of mimic that. And maybe they don't have access to all the cool teachers that I had and, and all these experiences. So, you know, in the end, it's something that forms itself with many different building blocks. And, and uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just very grateful that I get to do what I do, you know, is basically <laughs> the feeling I have about that. Yeah, totally. And, you know, some of this is just me, whatever, theorizing wildly. Um, but, but it seems to me like there's a potential balance between, um, let's say being more analytical with something that's like a creative field, like music, or even something that you just need to execute, like playing a sport, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, in some ways, it can be beneficial to be extremely analytical and know what's going on. But that can also hamper you. Right. That if you're yeah. thinking too much about, OK, what's the trajectory of this ball that I need to catch? Like you can't do it, you know, yeah. and if you're thinking too much about like, oh, OK, well, like I know my rudiments or like this is the scale or whatever, like you just sort of create like stilted, lame, um, you know, whatever music. And yeah. for someone like you where it's like, yeah, you have a formal education in music, you know, obviously very technically skilled. You have and, 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 you know, a tendency towards probably being more analytical about stuff, but you almost need to like 
kind of be able to turn that off in some ways. I don't know if, do you feel that way or do you feel like you're always analytical? You're never analytical. Am I just making stuff up? What do you think? No, you're absolutely right. That is actually for me, that's a key thing in, in creativity. And I've learned that, you know, the hard way by not being able to do it for a while. For a while, I was, it was very hard to turn off my analytical side because I was so versed in, you know, the, the, the theory of it and, and, and the rules of it that I forgot a little bit about, um, you know, what it is to just create. And I got to give my wife a lot of credit. Um, about 10 years ago, a little bit less, my wife said to me, like, you know, um, you know, when you were in SCARS, you were creating a lot and stuff since then. I mean, with SoWork, I was also actually part of the creative process, but they had some, you know, they had some people that were way more skilled at guitar. And obviously Bjorn as a vocalist, one of the best out there. So there's only so much I could contribute, you know, and even though they gave me a lot of freedom, my wife said to me, like, look, in Scarve, you were really a creative force. You were working with those guys coming up with all this cool stuff. You need to start your own project. Just make your own music. And I was very skeptical at first. I was like, well, you know, I'm not really a guitar player. I don't really, I don't know. It's probably going to suck, you know. And she's like, you have to do it. Just go for it. So she kept bugging me. So one day I was like, okay, I just sat down behind the drums. I just started recording a bunch of stuff. Turned out to be short intense songs turn out to be grindcore turn out to be ben c so then one day i just took all those drums i'd recorded you know which were very spontaneous things that i would do like let's say i would go down to my studio record a session and then in the last half hour i'd be like okay i'm just gonna record a couple of really you know one minute long two minute long intense things right whatever comes out just record it put it aside we'll see what happens so one day i picked up the guitar just started putting riffs on those songs and then i actually found that like man i actually love doing this and i actually you know, b back then I was still really bad at guitar. Now I'm like this much better, like a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I can do a little more like what I'm hearing in my head. But but anyway, um, tapping into that has become now like everything for me. And so so with Ben C, my grindcore band, the whole process is all about like letting go of any rules, any theory, just tapping into what's there, you know. So I'll just I'll just go to my my kit and just play something, record it see where it takes me. And then at some point I'll go back to that drum recording, pick up the guitar, start, put my finger somewhere on the, on the fretboard because I have no idea, you know, about guitar th theory. I know nothing about, even though I played violin as a kid, but I forgot all about like, you know, what the notes mean and stuff. Guitar, I have no clue what I'm doing. Actually, it's really funny. Like <laughs> last year when we were, when we were in Nashville uh, doing pre-production for the Megadeth album, Kiko at one point was like, yeah, that's not how you're supposed to hold your pick. Cause I was holding my pick like this, you know, like he's um, like, yeah, you should hold dude, it like this. I've been, I, I've been playing for like 20 <laughs> years and I hold my pick completely wrong. You're okay. <laughs> well, there you go. But that's, that's the thing. Like actually when you think about art and you think about some of the best art out there, whether it's music or other art, there are no rules. Like actually a lot of the most groundbreaking artists are the ones that broke the rules and that went against the grain of everything and just did what they felt. And that's something that's that's key to me and it's key in my lessons with my drum students. I tell them like, okay, all this stuff is your vocabulary. It's your knowledge. It's, it's you know, rudiments, this and that technique, whatever. But at some point, you got to just throw that all in a pot and forget about it and just play. Because playing, that's when you start expressing feelings. You start expressing what's inside of you you start tapping into something that's way deeper than just, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it takes us back to science, right? It's like, um, yeah. science can explain everything, but the wonder of the world that you feel like, like for me, you know, I, I love nature. So even though I live in, you know, in the city and I love the city too, but when I go out there, like I go to my yard and there's a big pot with a, a kumquat plant and there's a bunch of bees on there. And I can, I'm the kind of guy who can literally sit there and watch bees for 10 minutes just doing what they do because it just amazes me to see that. It's I know it's, it probably sounds silly to say, but it's true. And people who know me will know that I do that. I'll sit there and watch bees, you know, because it's just to me, it's just absolutely magical that that, that can exist. And I think it's beautiful. And, and so as much as science can explain all those things and the bees are doing this because of that and stuff, nobody can explain to me the wonder I feel when I see that. And when I see animals in general, I'm a big animal person. I can, you know, I can, one of my big dreams is to like go swim with whales or dolphins or whatever, you know, which I've never been able to do. I hope one day I can do something like that because it's the magic I feel around those creatures that are just unimaginably, you know, different from us. And yet at the same time, just organically live to me, that's, it's very similar to art. So it's tapping into something that that's deeper and that's maybe some people will say spiritual. I'm not really a spiritual person, but maybe it's, it borders on that a little bit, you know, 
And, uh, and so, yeah, so I absolutely, what you said is like exactly what I try to do when I create, you know, it's, it's going someplace that requires me to free myself of all chains and burdens and just express myself. Yeah. And it sounds like there's almost maybe, maybe sort of like three modes that you're sort of touching on, right? One is the kind of like analytical, you know, whatever understanding, maybe music theory aspect of something like, all right, what the hell is Gar playing in this part? Like we Mm -hmm. need to figure this out. You know, one is like being very creative, like you talked about. And then I don't know if this is maybe a separate one, but being very present, like, okay, I'm just going to watch bees or whatever. Um, You know, do do you feel like one of those modes is more uh, whatever easy for you or more natural, or do you feel like you kind of have the ability? ability to flip between them as necessary i'm i'm learning more and more to flip between them i think um it's 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 something that as i become more aware of those things i'm more in control of them and a lot of that actually has to do with um my take on life so um a big event in my life was when when my mom passed away uh, about three and a half years ago and again my wife uh was absolutely wonderful person. Um, uh, when my mom was sick the two years prior before she passed away, um, my wife really helped me connect with my mom and have really key important conversations and moments with my mom that made her passing, which we already kind of knew was likely to happen, uh, much easier on me and, and much more peaceful for me. Of course, it's, it's, it's devastating and you know, there's nothing that can change something like that. But, but without my wife, and her insight in that and telling me like, look, you know, there's a good chance your mom might pass away. You should talk to her about this. You should tell her that you should have these experiences with her, which I all did listening to her and being like, yeah, maybe you're right. You know, because there, here's the thing, there's a part of you when something like that happens. I, I don't know if you've had anybody close to you get sick and pass away, but there's a part of you that, that so wants to hope that this is not going to happen that, you know, part of you just wants to kind of be normal and be like, it's going to be fine, you know, and that was kind of happening to me. So she was telling me, look, you know, that's good. And I'm glad you're hopeful, but you should, should do this stuff just in case, you know, and so that I had all those experiences and my mom and I connected in really beautiful ways before she passed away. It meant a lot to me. I think it meant a lot to her. And, and so it, and so I learned immensely from that whole experience, you know, and, and from what my wife taught me about that. And since then, like, my my view on life has become a lot less about, oh, woe is me, which used to be younger me, you know, like, oh, I like feeling sorry for myself because I had a bad day or because something crappy happened or something, you know, whatever, whatever negative thing was, I let it, I allowed it to take over. And when I saw what my mom went through and how strong she was throughout that process and how much she still, you know, tried to enjoy the beauty of whatever she could still do, um, just inspired me to be like, okay, I need to stop being a wuss, like stop feeling sorry for myself. Everybody has problems, like big or small, it doesn't matter, you know, just enjoy every day because every day is a gift. It's true. It's a super big cliche, I know, but it's so true. And I think in our world, you know, in our society, we forget this because we get so overwhelmed with information, with work, with all these different things we were subjected to and we have to do that we forget sometimes to stop and watch the bees, you know, and that's and those those moments can be so key. I tell my drum students this, too. I, I mention them a lot because, you know, they're a big part of my life, especially these days. But I tell them, like, taking a break when you're studying or working is just as important as the work you're doing. It's maybe actually even more important because if you sit there and practice drums for four hours, you're going to eventually just burn yourself out and lose track. If you do drums for one hour and then you take a 10 minute break, go have a coffee, go talk to your girlfriend or or go watch the bees outside, you know, you're going to get in there with fresh energy. Or you're going to accomplish a lot more in less time rather than just burning out your brain and being too stuck. And those are all things I used to do, right? I used to be just, you know, hammer focused and, and just kind of burn myself out and, and end up being a very stressed out person that wasn't really enjoying a lot of the beautiful things that were happening in my life. And so my wife and my mom and also my dad taught me over time that like, there's a better way. And, and uh, I don't know what, what question I was answering with this, but basically nowadays, you know, that's, that's kind of how I, so my look at life has completely evolved and, oh yes, now I remember the three, the three different levels. And so yeah, I, yeah. I, I truly, I really try to be present as much as I can. And I'm not saying I succeed all the time because obviously nobody's perfect. I'm not. And, and it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to have bad days. There are days when, 
you know, it just sucks and, and I just can't get over myself and <laughs> whatever issue I'm having, it happens. But it happens a lot less frequently. And I allow uh, I don't allow that to happen nearly as often as in the past. And I think that's the takeaway of all this for me. Yeah, sure. And and with, with the situation with your mom, it sounds like that was, um, a, let, let's say, a catalyst for you kind of discovering the, the ability to be more present potentially. And is that something that, you know, came from just learning the appreciation of like, hey, you know, not everything is guaranteed and, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to, you know, end up in a bad spot at some point? Or was it a matter of potentially becoming more vulnerable with your mom, you know, given her situation? Like what, what was actually going on there? I think it was a little bit of both. Um, I definitely connected with my mom in ways that I might not have had she just still been alive today because there wouldn't have been that incentive to look for that connection and to say those things to her that I know meant so much to her. And then the other part is definitely just a real awareness, which I guess we all get at some point when we get older that, hey, you know, this is going to end one day and it could be tomorrow. You know, it could be today. You know, I mean, I had like I, I was my wife and I became good friends um, some years ago with Sean Reinert uh, and his husband. Mm. Uh, just kind of accidentally, I've always been a massive fan of his ever since I was a teenager, but we just happened to kind of become friends and just, we would hang out together and, and not even really music related at all. A lot of times we wouldn't even talk about music. We just, they'd come to our place or we'd go to their place. We'd order food, watch a movie, play a board game, that kind of thing, just have a blast. And, you know, and music was hardly even talked about a lot of those times. And then Sean earlier this year in, in January, just literally just, just, in once from one second to the next just passed away out of nowhere no health issues he just passed away and that was it he was gone and and it was such a shock you know for everybody for for us included because because it's just you don't see it coming like with my mom at least there was this a, a build up to to her passing because well she she was ill and we knew it was probably going to be terminal so again the message is you know every day is a gift and and you have to remind yourself of that you know it's it's so important because if you really understand what that means, you can get so much more out of each day. And my life is more satisfying now than it has ever been. And, and also, which is also even maybe even more important, is that I'm I'm a better person to the people around me. Because when you're self-absorbed, you know, which I, I was an only child, I grew up kind of a little bit antisocial kind of kid, not totally antisocial, but a little bit, you know, <laughs> a little bit in my own bubble. So I didn't really learn Same. about... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't really learn about other people's feelings and, and the value of them and stuff until way too late, kind of, you know. Um, so so for me, like being able to be a better person around other people and, and being more cognizant of, you know, how what I do and say affects other people is 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 it's super important. And and I've learned also through this process to to work on that. And it's it's a work in progress. Again, you know, I, I'm not saying that anybody out there should be should be the best. You know, it's it's not about that. It's more about the awareness and and knowing that those things really matter. And you know, it's 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 ironic with <laughs> with the current political situation when you have a guy running the country that's obviously you know incapable of feeling any sort of empathy to be talking about this stuff. <laughs> Totally. Well, and I, I also think it's interesting just as far as, you know, a lot of folks involved in whatever death metal, extreme music, et cetera, you know, that the, the, the person who's going to get into that obviously has some sort of, let's say, tendency towards darkness, right? A little bit of a penchant for like, yeah, you know, I'm interested in macabre ideas and, you know, maybe have a little bit of a tendency towards depression or, you know, a little bit of antisocialness in them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, you know, the, it doesn't mean that you're not necessarily – like, like you're talking about, you know, able to be um, more present, able to be, uh, you know, like a better, happier person, but you can still kind of like have, have both of those simultaneously, which I think is another interesting balance to find. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right about that. For me, um, when it comes to all the darkness and stuff, it's, it's part of this style. And, and I did have some tendencies towards depression when i was younger especially it's, it's gotten better as i got older but you know that was something i was actually diagnosed with was like mild depression periodically you know and uh, that just came from my life experiences i think and from some stuff that i just had a hard time processing but so probably that music spoke to me partly for those reasons as a teenager but also just i think the energy you know like 
my favorite bands were just high energy bands a lot of times. And, and especially when I was younger, there was a period of time where if it wasn't fast and growling and just super intense, I wasn't into it. So it just spoke to my teenage angst as well, you know, and just that kind of bottled up energy that you're trying to get out and you don't know how. And that music was just it for me because it was so over the top, especially back then when, you know, late 80s, when all that, all the death metal and grindcore was coming out. And it was just like, man, what is this? This is the most the most insane, extreme, intense thing in the world. So I didn't really care if they were singing about like repulsion about zombies and burning alive or or like morbid angel about Satanism or like napalm death about social issues. I loved all of it. You know, it was it was all of it for me was was uh, was was valid. And, and so I never got stuck on maybe some subjects that I couldn't really relate to. Uh, and I think let's be honest, you know, sure, there are some artists out there in the extreme world, some front men that really have a deep vision about, you know, whether it's religion or politics, et cetera, that really put that forward. But in the end, we're talking about music and, you know, it's, yeah. it's the overall picture. It's not just the lyrics. It's not just, the, Oh, there's a pentagram on the cover or whatever. You know, I mean, that's just kind of part of this fear because I mean, you, let's, I mean, you can't be a black metal band, put flowers on the cover. I mean, I'm sure probably someone has done it or will do it but yeah. <laughs> you know it's 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 the music is intense so the the what goes with it has to be intense in some way as well and has to challenge people so and also it wouldn't be cool if it was just so acceptable that the whole world loved it then we would probably all be like ah fuck that shit <laughs> let's get something more evil <laughs> the, you know <laughs> yeah the demo the demo was better before yeah. anyone liked it <laughs> exactly um, well I, th I think what you were talking about earlier just being able to you know see the beauty in bees flying around or whatever that at, at least for myself, you know, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying there just about, you know, a tendency toward darkness, et cetera. Um, you know, I think, I think for myself that some of the, the actual emotional toll on me as a person is lifted by recognizing like the broader beauty of everything, right. Where it's like, yes, that, you know, that, be, being a more positive person doesn't necessarily mean denying the reality of the world or like the darkness that exists in the world. It comes from recognizing that that's part of the whole and that actually makes it, you know, beautiful in the same way that like bees flying around and landing on stuff. are. I, I think I've mentioned this a few times on the podcast, but there's a clip of uh, Werner Herzog talking about the jungle in uh, in one of his films, right? And he just talks about like the, the overwhelming collective murder of the jungle and like how it's just like disgusting and it's like creatures eating each other. And it's like, you know, nature is, is red in tooth and claw, but that it's simultaneously beautiful. And like that to me is like, yes, that's just, that's exactly how I think of all this stuff and how, you know, the, the darkness actually results in almost a more positive feeling coming out of it. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's simple, man. It's, it's the yin and yang, you know, it's the duality of everything. It's life and death. It's darkness and light. Like one can't exist without the other. And, and the truth is, you know, death is the only inevitable thing in our lives, right? Well, death and taxes, I guess, but you know, it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's it's basically something that we're all in one way or another every single person on earth is trying to find a way to cope with the fact that one day we're gonna not be able to control our lives and we're gonna have to subject to death because you know in whatever shape or form it shows up it's gonna happen we know that for sure and and i think more than we think about our lives are influenced by that very concept because if you look at a human in today's society, we're all trying to be in control of our lives. We're all trying to figure out how we can pay the bills, how we can do our jobs, how we can navigate, you know, social life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that's all part of the bigger picture of like, yeah, one day we can't control things. And so if, if you see the duality, like you said, it brings peace. I guess it's kind of like wise man talk, but but it's the truth. You know, a lot of those older philosophies like Buddhism and stuff talk a lot about that when you read about it. And whether you believe or not in Buddhism and in, in the religious implications of that, I, I think actually, you know, I'm not a religious person. I grew up Catholic because my parents grew up that way. And so as a kid, I went to church and got, got baptized and all that stuff. And then eventually they got out of it. I got out of it. And I'm, I'm not religious at all. But I think there are a lot of interesting concepts in in the religions that I've studied, which is not not nearly all of them, but there's always some core philosophical values that make sense, you know. And of course, people can, you know, organize religion, use it and abuse it as they see fit. And so they do, of course, because we're humans and we're flawed and some people pursue power and, and, and you know, money before everything else. But but in the end, it's all it's it, again, it goes back to the, the core principle that like we will die one day. And what are you going to do with the time you do have, which you don't know how much it is? What are you going to do with that? You know, and I think that's 
that's everything really you know we don't realize that because we're overwhelmed with stuff but that's everything yeah not not necessarily the most positive message exactly but it kind of is <laughs> if you sort of think about it yeah it's it's dark it's you know i mean it's like you say it's a jungle thing right it's like you if you i've never been to, in a jungle but if you go there yeah you probably see the most bloody murder and the most atrocious things happen very there. very large bugs as well yeah yeah very large, exactly a lot of scary stuff at the same time probably one of the most beautiful places in the world to be so so that that duality exists and and i'm just fascinated by um, like, you know, that there are so many things even on our own planet that we don't know, like the oceans we know about, I, I don't know, somebody estimated like seven or 8% of the, the living creatures in the oceans. And that's something that nowadays it's super hard to imagine. Like, how's that possible? Like you think that by now scientists have figured all this stuff out, but no, there's like literally over 90% of living creatures in the ocean that nobody's ever seen or studied. That's nuts. Like, <laughs> that's a crazy yeah. thought. Well, we've already established we've already established that scientists are totally corrupt, and you know their <laughs> only goal is to you know get everyone <laughs> controlled through microchips and vaccines. So that's why we don't know what's going on. In that's the, uh, that's it. They the actually oceans. do know. Yeah. They know all the evil evil creatures in the in the seas. <laughs> Cthulhu yeah, is exactly. real. <laughs> Yes, it's down there, down there floating around. Um, so we've already touched on some of the uh, some of the projects that, that you have going on. So I want to I want to go through a few of these different things. Um, you just recorded some drums for a Megadeth album. You know, you, there's probably some stuff you can say about that, some stuff that you can't say about that. But what is going on with that? These new these these several recent Megadeth albums have all been quite good. So it's exciting that there's a new one potentially coming. Obviously, COVID is a disruption. What's going on with that? Uh, yeah, we had to push things back a little bit. But in the end of May, uh, both David Ellison and myself went to Nashville to to go in the studio there with Dave. Um, and we recorded drum and bass tracks for the record, which we'd been working on, you know, about a year and a half or so prior. We started, you know, with Dave working on song ideas and riffs. So the foundation for the album is done. Dave Mustaine is currently... Uh, recording all the guitars, all the rhythm guitars. Uh, Kiko, at some point, who's in Europe at the moment, is going to come over and, and work with him on all the stuff. So it's it's in progress. And I guess, of course, we recorded actually a lot of songs. And I, I'm pretty sure not all of them are going to be on the album. But the overall direction of the record is definitely it's going to be a thrash album. It's going to be a metal album. It's heavy. There's a lot of heavy stuff. So I'm very excited about it because I really, you know, as I said earlier, the old Megadeth is kind of like what I grew up with, and that's that's not to, not to discredit anything they did in their career, but that's the stuff that touches me the most. And so, um, so I wanted to bring that energy, and and I was able to because Dave, being the front man he is, let me try stuff, let me do stuff. He was actually encouraging me to go crazy in some parts and stuff, and and I think that really, you know, that was a very. Uh, very exhilarating time to be able to do that it was pretty surreal actually to be in the studio with those guys and uh, so yeah it's in progress totally. um i can kind of think that it'll probably hopefully come out early 2021 sometime in the spring maybe but that's pure conjecture at this point sure and c commenters on the internet want to know are there blast beats <laughs> I, i'll uh, wait and see <laughs> Okay. I know that's been a big question, but uh, I I did some yep. stuff. We'll see, we'll see what what happens. <laughs> maybe one of those sort of like weird fake blast beats, like what that uh, that I don't know. Maybe um, what what was the drummer who who did like a fake blast beat in like a uh, like jazz ensembles in like the the sixties or something? Maybe maybe you, oh, you threw in like a few yeah, like one that. of those like one handed like yeah yeah. Yeah, because that's that's true. Actually, blast beats come from jazz, totally. Like those were the first guys that did like one-handed rolls really fast, like the gravity blasting on the yeah, kind of like ka -da -da -ka -da -da -ka -da -ka -da -ka -da. Yep, exactly. Yep. <laughs> we didn't invent yeah, anything, totally. folks. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. It's 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 in there, and you don't even notice it because it's like over some slow part, right? It's like some weird modal chord changes, and the guy's just like ka -ka 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 you're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's it's not scum, but it's but it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned Bent C, which is kind of your you know uh, you're working with Shane Embry from from Napalm Death. And then does the singer from Aborted do vocals for that? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. correct. Yeah, ben. that's awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah. 
Yeah. And, and it seems like that's sort of like, you know, your, your, your sort of creative outlet to mess around with some stuff. You put some songs out from that recently. What's going on there? What, what, what should people listen to? Well, yeah, I put out a couple of songs under the uh, Insta Grind series, which is something I started to do in these quarantine times because I just had a lot of creativity happening and, uh, and, and some extra time due to, you know, all tours being canceled, etc. So I decided to take some of my free time and just express myself, as I was saying earlier. And, and um, because I had already written a lot of stuff in the past couple of years prior to, to this uh, lockdown happening, and that's in the works of being finished, there's a whole album's worth of material plus a bunch of extra stuff or like, you know, that I plan releasing in various ways, uh, EPs, etc. And so um, I already sent all that stuff to Shane and Sven who are actually in the process of, you know, getting around to recording their parts of that these, these days, actually. And I, because both, both guys are busy and obviously in, in Shane's case has like a trillion bands. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight, but in the meantime, I decided, well, I have this extra time. I'm just going to keep writing. I'm just going to do stuff. And I really don't want to give those guys more, you know, I already sent them like 35 songs. I really don't want to send them more material at the moment. Cause it's going to be like impolite at this point, you know, like, Hey, you remember those 35 <laughs> songs? Here's 10 more, you know, <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, so I decided to just, um, I, it was cool, man. I got to jam with like Athenar from midnight on a track. I got to invite, um, I'm the singer from Feastum who are a fantastic grindcore band, uh, from Finland that I've loved for many years. And I, I met him actually at a festival, not knowing who they were. He was actually our driver with Sorek. He was like driving bands back and forth to the festival from the hotel. And he's like, Hey, I play in a grindcore band. So I checked him out, fell in love with the band, kept in touch with, with Petri, who's a great guy. So I got to invite him to play on a track with me. Jesper, who used to play bass in Nassim, has recorded a bunch of bass for me. So oh, cool. yeah, all these people, there's a bunch more coming. So I just basically, it turned into this thing where um, I just wanted to have fun with it, send it to people that I, I got to meet and that I admire who have influenced me musically in some way or another that I got to know over the years and just make some killer music. So that's Instagram. So that's that's coming out song by song on Bandcamp, YouTube. Um, I haven't really dug into Spotify stuff because I'm not a big fan of the Spotify uh, don't give the musicians any money, Casa, but <laughs> eventually I'll probably have to put it on Spotify. But anyway, yeah, so so Instagram is like the latest stuff. And then there's a full album in the works and a bunch more things. And 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 Ben C is all about, you know, I'm exploring like where I can go within the, the, the realms of grindcore, but also a lot of the other stuff I grew up in. Like one of my favorite bands, which should speak to you being in a band called like rats is uh is godflesh and uh, are, are you wearing a godflesh shirt right now i have to oh yeah <laughs> yep. yes which is excellent yeah so they're they're you know they're next to napalm death which is probably my favorite band of all time godflesh is is, is definitely the other one and and i love many bands i mean there's many bands that i would put near the top of my list but those two you know i think justin is is a genius and and actually Benny the bass player as well you know that what what they managed to do as to people with 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 the way they express themselves to me is just absolutely phenomenal and I actually got to meet Justin uh, about a little over a year ago at at the Decibel Metal and Beer Fest in LA and and for me that was kind of like you know the the only other thing that I could imagine being as important would be if I ever got to meet Prince which was one of my you know, uh, influences as, as a little kid. The first album I ever bought was Purple Rain. So I imagine if I would have met Prince, I would have probably wouldn't have known what to say. But, you know, like meeting Justin to me was that kind of like awesomeness because he's just so important to me, the music he makes, you know, and everything. I listen to like his electronic stuff, his ambient stuff. Like it's just his form of expression is is, is amazing to me. So, so the, and, and so what I, where I'm going with this is some of that influence also goes into Ben C. So, and, and you can hear that, you know, if you listen for the Godflesh isms, you'll you'll find them. <laughs> you'll notice a few. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Definitely. totally. Um, and then you also you, you, you're you're looking at starting a recording studio. What's going on with that? Yes, uh, my wife and I, together with um, a fantastic uh, producer slash engineer named Adair Dalfenbach. He's from Brazil, but lives here in the states, and um, I've worked with him a lot over the past years. Uh, we, the three of us got together and decided to, to, to kind of, you know, we've been working kind of in a lockout with a pretty good setup, but we decided to officialize it and find a place. So we found this place in Hollywood uh, that's really central and, and we're in the process of turning that into a studio. And Adair had actually worked there for a while, so some of the work is done, but we're continuing it now as soon as we can. It's been slowed down with the pandemic, but it's going to be called uh, Northwood Sound Studios. 
And uh, we've kind of been working under that banner, doing some recordings, like when we did the Cadaver album and a few other things. It's already, you know, being labeled as that. But the studio is going to be in an actual proper location where, you know, all the all the stuff will be there for it to be a good experience for people to come in. And, you know, I've always been looking for a different a different thing because I, I relied on being in bands and touring pretty much, you know, my entire life. And as cool as that is. As you can see in this pandemic, you know, that those things can really be <laughs> fluctuate. I mean, we've had so many tours canceled the past two years. It's a wonder I'm still here talking to you and not under a bridge somewhere. So <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, you know, we've been looking for another way to 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 do business and music because at some point you have to do business and and because working with Adair has been such a wonderful thing and he's just an absolutely amazing producer. Uh, we decided, hey, this could be a, a cool way to do it. And we're hoping to be able to to get some interest and to get some people in there through the fact that, you know, I go on the road under normal circumstances, meet a lot of people. I get to talk to bands and musicians. And and so, you know, the goal is to get that operation off the ground as soon as we can. should be really cool. It's going to be, we have some really cool stuff planned for it. Yeah. And, you know, once you get a few things out there with the name on it that sound good, you know, I mean, as much as people just listen to stuff on Spotify, there are people who flip through the liner notes and are like, where was this recorded? Oh, it was recorded there. That's where we're going. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and even though a lot of people nowadays use software and stuff to, to get things done, um, uh, there's still a real need for a band to be able to go and work with a producer in a studio in a good environment where they don't have to worry about all the technical aspects and they can just go and perform their music and get it captured and, and produced in a way that makes sense to them. So that's kind of our goal. You know, I know as doing both of those things myself, I know how liberating it is when you don't have to worry about all that. Like I produced some of the Ben C stuff myself, some of the older stuff, you know, where I decided, hey, I don't have any money for this. I'm just doing it for fun. I'm just going to mix and master it. And I did that for a batch of tracks. And I think that's probably the first and last time I'll ever do that because it really, you know, the amount of time and work it takes, especially if you're not necessarily educated in production, it just kind of sucks the the fun out of, for me at least, you know, it's like the fun out of the creative process because you end up hearing the song so many times. They're like, okay, when it's finally finished, you're like, I'll probably never listen to that again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I hate this. I, I notice every minor thing wrong with the performance on it. Yeah. So if I do listen to it, I'm just pissed because this part comes in a little early, like, all that no stuff. Good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you, you want to at some point, you want to be able to create and just put it out and, and then actually enjoy and listen to it. You know, like maybe not like the next day, but maybe a year down the line, you're like, oh, yeah, that album was so cool. And you put it on and you can actually enjoy what you were trying to express. And to me, that's that's part of why I love music. So, I mean, I listen to music all the time. I listen. I'm, I'm discovering new bands and new artists all the time. But but my own music, sometimes I listen to as well. And I'm not ashamed of that. You know, I mean, why would I make it if I if I'm not listening to it? Then, you know, I get shocked sometimes, like when artists say like, oh, I never listen to my own stuff. And I can see it in a way, because if you're constantly being creative, you don't want to be, you know, in something that's already done and you want to move ahead from that. And you kind of have it in your head anyway, because you spent a lot of time on it. But sometimes it's good to just sit down and, and kind of be like, oh, yeah, I remember that record. Like sometimes I'll put on an old Scarf record or something or an old Soil Work record and be like, and go yeah. transport it back to that time. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, that's awesome. And then as if this man didn't have enough projects, you have a, a, a radio show that you do too, which you kindly played Like Rats on a few months back. What, what's what's up with that? You, 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 is it every week? I mean, you, you're, you're constantly digging into new music and, and putting that out there for people. What's going on? It's every other week now. It used to be every week. Okay. But that, yeah. that proved to be a little much for me, like with my schedule. So uh, we switched it to bi-weekly. It's, it's on Gimme Metal. And um, I try to always be in the chat room the whole show. So because it's it's really fun. It's it's You can interact with me, ask me questions about anything. And I'll answer them while, while the show is happening, streaming live. And yeah, it's actually great because it really put me back into a, a discovery of new music mode, which I had kind of lost for some years. I was kind of, there was a time where I didn't really feel like anything that was coming out really added to the equation of this, the old stuff I already knew. But I feel like the last years and like Rats is an example, but there's been many, ba many newer bands where I'm like, wow, something in the extreme underground is happening right now. There's an immense creativity. There's a lot of new territory being discovered, new grounds explored, you know. People are pushing the envelope. Bands like Imperial Triumphant, you know, Dodecahedron, um, so many, you know, Infernal Coil, I could name like, 
you know, dozens of bands that have just blown my mind where I'm like, wow, these guys are really taking extreme music and, and bringing it to a new place and doing something new. And, and so for me, it's like as a fan of music and, and, and how important it is to me in my life, I want to share that with people. That's what Dirk's Extreme Blast is all about. It's about, I play, of course, some classic stuff. And, you know, most of my shows, I have a Mega That Song and Napalm That Song, <laughs> usually a Godflesh yeah. song. <laughs> I try to take him out sometimes because I'm like, okay, it's going to become too predictable. But, <laughs> but a lot of it is about newer releases and, and, and playing new bands for people and and uh and and it's fun it's a lot of fun yeah totally and and and, you know there's so much stuff available and there's so much stuff out there that having some opportunity for curation is huge right because even if someone does want to keep up with everything like it's overwhelming and it's stressful and if you have someone who at least you somewhat trust their taste and it's like okay i'm just gonna like check out what this person recommends to me like that that that's hugely valuable Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I try to do my best to kind of include a little bit of everything that I hear. And, and, you know, it's not always necessarily something that I 100% like would go out and buy because I don't want it to be completely like obtuse and like, oh, it's only my vision. But but in, in the process, I'm becoming more open minded. You know, I'm hearing stuff that I didn't think I would be into that. I'm like, oh, this is actually really killer. You know, I didn't think this band would be something I'd be into. So it's an educational process for me as well. And and uh, and I have to say, I have to mention this too, is that like it really opened me up to Bandcamp, you know, which which is such an awesome, oh, sure. awesome platform that I want to promote. I'm not being paid by them, but I promote them a lot because I just think it's beautiful that there's actually a platform that where the artists get most of the money. Like it's it's probably the only platform in the entire history of recorded music and, and music being sold where artists actually get like 75 to 80 percent of what they're selling, which is how it should be, how it always should have been in my view. And, you know, I get it that there's a percentage that needs to go to the people that do all the work, like labels, that maybe it can't always be 80%, maybe it has to be a little lower. But in truth, as you know, for recording artists, it's usually more towards the 5 or 10% if you're lucky, you know, which is, which is wrong. In my opinion, it's just plain wrong because we're the guys that everybody else around it exists and can work because we provide the content and we have the inspiration to do this stuff. So we should get at least a decent cut. And Bandcamp? does that and so i always tell people okay i know everybody's on spotify i get it i'm not uh because <laughs> i'm not a fan They're, they they have to pay more you know and i know there's a lot to that and people are working on legislation and stuff here in the states to to fix that so i'm 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 keeping track of, i'm open to it but in the meantime bandcap is a great place almost everybody's on there it's it's just a great system i love it yeah. And I think it's, it's, you know, there's a difference between just like discovery and convenience versus like, okay, I'm actually, you know, behaving as a consumer right now. And the reality is, is a lot of people aren't invested enough in music to really care. Mm-hmm. And like, yes, you know, if you're, if you're looking for the most convenient option or you're just trying to like play through a bunch of random shit, like something like Spotify may work well for that. But yeah, if it's like, okay, I want to actually support this artist, like you mentioned, Bandcamp is a, a can't go wrong type of situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, it's, 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 it's right. You know what you said? Like, it's, it's like kind of like when I think about myself and books, like I read books, but I'm not, I'm not versed in literature to the point where I would pretend to know anything about that in general. You know, I can't go to a bookstore and be like how I am in a record store where I kind of know <laughs> the deal. Yeah. And so then it becomes a lot more of a superficial thing and, and you're not necessarily connected with it in the same way. And that's of course how a lot of music is consumed in the world. That's only normal, but when people understand that, like, you know, if you're really a fan, you want to support these bands. You don't just want to have Spotify and listen to their stuff and be super excited about it and then and then never buy their music. I mean, people will say, OK, I go to shows, I buy merch. Of course, that's cool, too. But for a band to be able to actually sell copies of their music and have limited vinyl runs and stuff, I don't know. Maybe it's because I grew up with that stuff. But for me, that's such an intricate, I mean, an intimate part of the whole thing. You know, it's it's just intrinsically part of what enjoying music is about for me. Like, I love putting on a vinyl. It's it's the yeah. best. It's an experience. Yeah, totally. Right. And it's like, yeah, there's a difference between like, okay, I'm responding to emails and I'm just going to listen to something on YouTube or Spotify versus like, now I'm going to listen to this record. You know, mm-hmm. and that's that's a different experience and a different use case for it. So yeah, takes us, takes yeah, band camp and takes us back again also to enjoying the day. You know, take time. Like every now and then, I'm not I can't do that all the time, but every now and then, sit down, pull out a vinyl or a CD if that's what you have, throw it on, look at the liner notes, immerse yourself in the vibe, shut off everything else. You know, have your cat, cat or your dog on your lap, whatever, and just enjoy a good album because it's it's you'll you'll see how awesome it is. We forget, you know. <laughs> Totally. 
So Derek, that's a bunch of projects. Is there anything else that you want to plug that you want people to check out that you're doing or, um, you know, a, a random album that you did session drums on that you think is underappreciated because your uh, encyclopedia Metallum page is outrageous. <laughs> what, what, what do you want people to do? Oh man, there, I don't know, man. There, there are quite a few, you know, that I think are underappreciated. I have to, I haven't even, to be honest with you, I've been so busy these days, like the past years that I haven't really been able to even keep track. Like I haven't, completed my my releases on my website in like three years which is at this point it's overwhelming to even go dig through (laughs) everything i recorded and put it up i have to do it but but i mean there's a lot like here's what i'll say like go to my website go to my pages you know if you're interested in what i did and 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 just listen to some stuff here and there you know i tried to put links as much as i can um and there's there's a lot of cool things i mean you know, I think I think some stuff drifts to the surface. Like Cybreed is, is is an album that you know the Antares album that I did back with those guys back in in 2007. I think it came out, and that's an album that kind of gained some recognition with in the underground, and and it was a really fun album to make. And I think people should go back and listen to that. They should check out actually uh, uh, those guys' new band called Obsidians, which I recently tracked a song uh for them and and bjorn from soul work is singing on it they just released that i think last week that's pretty cool in that genre of music and um and yeah man i mean i i have i have a lot of things in the works i can say that there's a lot coming like i, I shane and i have been on a, on a bit of a creative role there's the tronos album that came out last year that that we both worked on together there's another speaking of god flesh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I totally went like gut flesh drums on that one for sure. I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> I was like, you guys don't mind, right? Because they sent me, that was one of those cases where like, hey, Dirk, here's a bunch of guitars, put some drums on this. I'm like, okay. And I told them, I'm like, you guys are okay if I mimic some gut flesh style beats, right? And they're like, totally go for it. So <laughs> that was really great. Um, but Shane is awesome. Shane is like one of these hyper creative people that just constantly has you know, a million things going on. And, and I think we inspire each other mutually, you know, uh, we became friends over the years and, and we're constantly sending each other stuff. And, and it's amazing for me to be able to work with somebody that has such a massive impact on my life from when I was a teenager, you know, he's such a humble down to earth guy and such a, just, you know, he doesn't do it for any other reason that just, he loves music and he loves making music with, with people. And that's how I am too. You know, like all the other stuff is cool. Like it's cool to go on tour. Of course, I'm super grateful that I'm in a, in a band of the caliber of Megadeth and to be able to do that is just absolutely astonishing. And I appreciate every moment of that. But at, in the end, at the end of the day, for me, it's about good music. That's what I love. And that's what I'll love until the day I'm not here. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there.